We now have started the recording. So if you're out there in Blab land, welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm, <laughs> we're about a minute from starting. So Brad, can you hear me well? And Yeah, I can hear you perfectly. Can you hear me? I can hear you. You're much better than before. I'm still a little mute, a little, um, <clears throat> excuse me, muffled, but much, much better than before. Good. So if you are on and you can hear us, just type a yes in the chat box. So we know that you can hear us. I see a few people have joined. I'm going to take a sip of my coffee here. Let me see if I can get the audio up. Brad, I only have audio on you. Is that a, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, I'm gonna. I, can I can't see you, but can I can hear, hear you. you. I'll be back in in a second. Uh, I'm just trying to get the audio. Well, I'm gonna get started. Well, hello there, Blab World. This is Susie Go Miller, ahead. the Better Relationship Coach, committed to helping you create better relationships in just 30 days or less. And I am here to talk about boomers and millennials with my co-host and very good friend, Brad Zalas, the millennial expert. So today we are going to be talking about boomers and millennials, a different approach to almost everything. And kind of the underlying thought of that is a kind of a rules versus results. And I'm going to let Brad unpack that as well as give a little overview. If you've missed our other words, just a two to three minute. Here's how we got here. So take it away, Brad. Uh, good morning, Susie. Uh, anybody wide awake? Uh, it's Friday. It's awesome. We have great weather here in New York. Uh, but if you've followed our train of thought through the last, uh, what what has it been, four blabs before this, Susie? Yeah. So what happened is we covered how boomers uh, were raised a little bit. We're going to go over that again. But um, when they raised millennials, they threw away the rule book because a new group of experts came in and said, you have to raise these kids differently. You can't put them down. You can't judge them. You can't um, tell them that there's a right way and a wrong way. You have to let them be children as they grow up. And so what started to take place is um, there were three major influences, and that is science fiction became science fact, both on television and in movies and things like that. The second was video games and interactive devices came into the household like the computer and toys that talk to these kids. So where the boomers had the electronic a sitter where we would sit in front of the TV, this generation actually had devices that interacted with them. They were like, like having a robot. It was the beginning actually of robots and, and artificial intelligence talking to them like Teddy Ruxpin. Anybody remember Teddy Ruxpin and uh, speak and spell and things like that. So those came along. And then here's the interesting part. The third piece, and we covered this last week was, um, child-centric parenting and child-centric teaching. And what that did is it turned parents and teachers and authority figures into peers. And guess what that did? Flattened the hierarchy in the household. It flattened the hierarchy in the school system, at least in their minds and structurally. And so when they went into the corporate world, a lot of corporate uh, people were shocked when uh, a millennial would walk or a Gen Wire would walk right up to the CEO and say, hey, Chad, I'm going to show you how to run this place. Um, so their idea of hierarchy and structure and things like that right. don't exist. <laughs> and we're going to touch. And so we've covered all that. Now we're going to go into what do you do now? Now that this is all out, what do you do? And today's episode is about rules. And that really, Brad, results. is the is the different yeah. approach. You know, as we were talking about that the different approach to almost everything is boomers have a rules approach to everything. That's their lens and filter. And millennials have a results approach to everything. Um, and you may have, this may be familiar to me, to you. I'm sorry, we talked about this last week with child-centric parenting. It showed up there where the kid would be like, why do I have to read any longer? Or why, does, do, I, why do I have to do homework for one hour when I can get it done in 25 minutes? Well, the rule says one hour of homework and the kid's right. like, I got it done. So that little, those two little words encapsulate the difference in the approach that we take. And as you can imagine, loggerheads cause of that. Right. Well, there, there's several things and I actually want to go over them, but I'm discovering them along the way with you. And that is there are a lot of things, maybe about five things that millennials truly don't have in their brains. And one of them is shame. Uh, they were never shamed in public. I don't know about you, Susie, but my mother and father, once in a while, they would whoop my butt in public. Um, it, it was rare, but um, 
corporal punishment was always hanging out there. Like when you get home, you're going to talk to your father, mister. And my father would punish me. And it, uh, the, the worst was, like I said, they would paddle you. Uh, the best is maybe, uh, you know, they give you a lecturing and send you to your room. And there was nothing in your room except books. <laughs> I remember those days. Books, <laughs> right, the, right. Our monopoly. Well, and I think... <clears throat> Go ahead. And, and we're... We're the only generation that knows how to play solitaire with real cards. I remember my mom saying, you know, don't tell me you're bored. You've got a brain. So I would use that with my own kids. Now, here's the thing. I know you're going to go through all five of them, and I'm going to offer a little commentary on each one. So the whole idea of shame, you know, shame shuts us down and causes us to either scramble or perform. And so as boomers, we were taught you better get it right, because if you don't get it right, that means there's something wrong with you, not with how you did something. I would say that we've got to find a new word for it. The shame that a millennial feels is nothing like that. Their shame is, I didn't get it done, but there's no sense of shame. Shame is basically something's wrong with me. And they have no sense of that because as parents um, and as a world culture, we were like, Johnny's fabulous. Feel good about Johnny. Johnny, do your best. And the whole kind of thrust of our parenting was to make sure Johnny and Sally and Susie and Mary and Bob felt good about who they were. So shame as to there's a flaw in me that we grew up with and I better work to fix it didn't exist for our millennials. And so that's kind of one of those huge things. If something's wrong, a boomer thinks, oh, what did I do wrong? What's wrong with me? A millennial thinks, how did you screw up? Because I'm fabulous. Go ahead, Brad. <laughs> Perfect, right. Well, in this, there was this belief that um, boomers, the reason they were the way they were, they, they had no self-esteem or whatever, was because they were shamed and told that you're a kid, shut the hell up and all this thing. And they were put in their corner and they began to cower where so, you know, as I, we said in our previous post, Carl Rogers came along and said, no, no, you can't do this to children you can't paddle them you can't do any of these things you have to raise them in such a way that they're they're seen as angels almost and i'm, I'm not knocking this i want you to see that some parts of this are incredible um they uh, released something in, the, in our children and now they're adults they all want to be business people and things like this but the idea of right and wrong was taken out of our curriculum at home and it was taken out of the curriculum at school. And so nobody got paddled for doing something wrong because it was like, well, he's a kid. You have to excuse his behavior right now because he doesn't really know any better. And so we took out of the curriculum this, um, there is a right path. And part of that, Brad, path. I'm going to interrupt you here. And I don't want to make it just boomers blew it. We embraced the beginning of the, po the middle of the postmodern movement. So part of the reason there was no right and wrong at home was because we were wrestling with a world that was beginning to tell us there is no absolute truth. So there's a, you know, and because we were so narrow focused growing up, we wanted to be open. Our parents weren't open. So God forbid, we're going to be open. <laughs> Okay, so number two, right and wrong, right. no shame. What's number three? Uh, they didn't go to church. I mean, I mean, some some uh, millennials did. I don't want this to be an absolute, but a lot of them didn't go into the churches on a Sunday morning uh, and things like that. And if they did, they didn't really like the message uh, because I've spoken to quite a few millennials, and the one thing that they, bothers them the most is that. Um, uh, if Jesus was about love, why are we persecuting gay and lesbian and transgender people? So millennials were kind of raised with this attitude that, um, you know, don't judge. Right. Don't judge people at all. So I, I would say number three is really this no judgment. Well, and it's really of, interesting. Uh, I have a master's of divinity, which is a pastor's degree, and have preached my share of sermons. And it was very interesting with my kids as, as they grew up and, and began to ask those questions. So mom... The, you know, if our religion or our faith says this, you know, or if Jesus says this or our, our Bible says this, why does our religion or our church seem so different? And it really became very incongruent. And we didn't have a lot of good answers because we were taught you don't question what the priest says. You don't question what what the what the leaders say. And suddenly our kids were saying, hey, and I really applaud millennials for this because I think it has changed and is beginning to shape a whole new faith culture in our world where we're much more open-minded where we're much more willing to embrace people and not overlay there's not a sense of tolerance like i tolerate you we're not overlaying our beliefs on others and we're saying there's room for all of us because really the bottom line is love and that's a big thing i've had a lot of conversation with my kids about 
you know, because they'll come back with, well, if it's about love and acceptance, why are we persecuting or judging? Or why aren't we sitting down to dinner with? And so they really helped shape kind of my mindset and, and who I was as a, you know, believer or faith person as I raised my first child. By the time my second and third child got to high school, you know, they, there was a lot of variations there. So I do want to say that ability to say, hey, wait a minute, that we kind of, it's really a double-edged sword because there's that idea of we love that they speak up and teach and talk to us, except for when we think they're being disrespectful or disagreeing. So it's a real, you know, I don't want to be a millennial. Right. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, someone just uh, wrote mm -hmm. in uh, Chuck Bartok. He said that um, in the heartland, this wasn't really, uh, uh, you know, they have a strong mm -hmm. family system and things like this. And I want to say your experience may be unique within the town structure that you live in. And I come from a small town, so I, I get it. But if you step outside or even better, I want you to do this, go to your millennial that you drag to church and you, you know, you, they, maybe they were even in Boy Scouts or you should taught them how to shoot a gun or whatever, more of the, the conservative way of living, which is the way I was raised as well. Um, and I want you to sit down and actually ask them what they think about this stuff and don't judge the answer because you will be shocked at what your millennial who you took to church every Sunday will say about certain things, about gays and lesbians, transgenders, and uh, also what they say about um, other races and stuff. You know, I, I was raised at a time where it seemed like racism was going away, and then it came back, and I'm like, what the hell's going on? And, you know, my, yeah, it's, it doesn't make any sense, but this, this generation is not big on racism because they're listening well, not to just rappers, rappers uh, Not just rappers. Uh, they love Brad, it. I would say we live in a much more global society. I am a minority. My dad was from India, uh, Pakistan. My mom was American, and I was raised in the early 70s in school, and it wasn't cool to be ethnic. Diversity was very shunned, and people would say, well, where are you from? And I'd be like, America, I was born here, with no idea that I didn't look like, kind of like you, white bread, blonde hair, blue eyes, and people really thought I was different. And I'll never forget this day that um, one of my, we were in high school, and my sister's boyfriend broke up with her because he didn't want to date a foreigner anymore. He wanted to date an American girl. And I, of course, was livid and went up and punched him. But I, it was interesting to look at that contrast versus I'll never forget, we do live outside the D.C. area, and I'll never forget 9-11, when the diversity issues here were so different because my kids not only were raised outside D.C., but they were raised in a much more ethnically diverse world where being ethnic was cool. My son had a, um, like a password at one point in time, Zach the Packy. And it was like embracing their, you know, their racial diversity, embracing the global world, global faith, global differences as being really good and almost preferred. So it's interesting to see that shift. What do you think? Yeah. Oh, I agree with that. And I'll tell you why. Um, I'm, you know, as you know, my father's Hungarian and I grew up in a tough Hungarian household. My father was the first generation born here in the United States. And here's the hysterical part. Um, my father always felt like the outcast because we were in a German, Pennsylvania, Dutch uh, community, Catholic upbringing, things like this. So my father would always tell me how, you know, the Zalas name and all this. And I always hung out with the Greek kids. And although I look about as white as you can get, you know, I'm, I'm got the Hungarian uh, side as well. So uh, years later, my father is giving me this lecture about how things, you know, about, the, you know, we're outcasts in this town and, you know, we're the Hungarians. We, we you know, most of us are in Bethel and no, no, no. And I'm driving through town and he's sitting next to me and people are like, Hey Brad, what's up? And I go, Hey man, what's up? Boop, 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 boop. I must've run into 30 people and he's in the middle of his lecture. And I said, you know, dad, that was a truth for you. That was not a truth for me. I said, I was accepted. I was cool. I was, and nobody cared that I was, you know, of this different background and my best friends always wanted to come to our house to have food because the food was spicy and better. And they were like, this is delicious. So there was this transition and you, you know it. I mean, if I was hanging out with you, I probably would have hung out with you more than I would have hung out with the, you know, uh, anybody else. Cause I always hang out with um, certain people. And I, I bet everybody's looking at you at the school ground when, when you punched to that guy and they were like, wow, the Latina chick is really angry. <laughs> you know, and then, Latino. Was, exactly. Was, exactly. Wow. Although when I did, when I, I used to have that long, pretty woman hair, and I was then I really got it when I was in school, too. It was so funny. And I did experience racial profiling when I went to the airport around the time of 9 11, and that was kind of odd. But you're right. If you had dark hair and dark eyes, people would come up to me and start speaking Spanish. I'd be like, 
whoa, whoa, don't know it. You know, not necessarily that fast. Yo hablo inglés. <laughs> okay, so we've we've touched on four of them. So let's. Oh. What's the fifth one? We've got. Uh, the, uh, well, mm-hmm. well, the first was no shame. The second was mm-hmm. uh, no no right and wrong. Mm-hmm. Third was no judgments, and the fourth we're going to get into is uh, the the work ethic shifted. You have a generation. I, I you probably remember this. <laughs> You'd go to McDonald's when you were a kid, and the straight A students worked at McDonald's. Uh, I don't know about you, but I, my dad said you have to get a job. I'm I'm ten. What are you talking about? So my father grew up during the Great Depression, and he just felt you should be working all the time. So if I give you a list of all the jobs I had, you'd be rolling. I've done everything from dig ditches, clean toilets. Um, I've driven auto parts truck. I've been a, a stand-up comedian. I've, uh, I've done every job you, you can name. And my wife is astounded because today, if I go to cook breakfast, I can do it probably in less than 10 minutes. The, everything's on the table with sliced oranges, toast, and the works. And she just goes, how do you do that? Well, I've been cooking for four people since I was 10 years old because my father expected me to do it. He's Hungarian, an immigrant, raised during the Great Depression. So guess what? I was raised during and the Great And I think, Depression. you know, I remember it's interesting. <laughs> people often ask, did you pay your kids for chores? Did you get paid for grades? And what you just mentioned is really interesting. We, got pay- we didn't get paid for chores. You were expected to do these chores because you were part of the family. We were expected to get a certain level of grade, but we were kind of, that was our work. You know, our dad would say, this is your job. And he was raised in a very education sets you ahead in the world. And so, you know, but there was always jobs we could earn money for, you know, and I think as I'm listening to you, it's really interesting that it came from that work ethic. We're going to teach them to work and earn money because that's what matters versus, you know, I remember saying to my kids, you know, you are doing jobs because you live here, but there wasn't that you have to have a job because you need to begin already to make your way. You're, you're absolutely right. Well, we, we were also taught to be afraid that if we screwed up, uh, there'd be hell to pay. So you, know, you look at these influences, and I'll tell you why I started talking about this. I was doing a workshop down in Texas on cracking the millennial code. And after three hours, I'm, I'm working my tail off to get this stuff across. This Gen X woman raises her hand, and I go, yes. And she goes, you know something? They don't do anything this way, this way, this way. And and why don't they care about being successful? They need to be successful. They need to do this and this and this. And I looked at her and I said, okay, wait, first of all, slow down for a second. When millennials were raised, we removed that they had to get up early. We removed that they have to um, be afraid of their boss or afraid of anything. We removed all this stuff where, uh, you know, you know, if if you mess up, your career is over. We removed all that. And now you're sitting here telling me you expect them to be successful the way you were when everything has changed. They, you know, people don't realize this. Why aren't more kids mowing lawns and, and shoveling snow? I'll tell you why, because they can build websites and make 20 grand over the summer uh, building uh, the pizzeria and the local bars websites. Right. Why the hell should they not go to mention? Outside? Not to mention, we had we had <laughs> yeah. people we hired to do it because you know Johnny had organized sports, Susie had you know piano and dance and ballet. It's so interesting. I had a client just the other day, and we were talking about all their kids were doing, and I said, okay, wait a minute. Do you understand that from four o'clock until nine o'clock every single day, you're taking your kids somewhere and they're mad at you that their uniforms aren't ready. And so we kind of had this little bit of a, let's step back and look at this. You know, it's, it, they were in dance and, you know, and music and sports and the world really did revolve around them. And so I think there was this idea of why should I work? You know, you know, this is sounds so, <clears throat> I don't mean this to sound Per, uh, pejorative, but there were laborers that were hired to come clean our house and do our lawn and change the sheets and, and not not necessarily for me or my kids, but there were that was kind of the why do I have to do this question because life is my life is more important. And I literally had a client yesterday that I said to her, stop doing your kids' laundry. She's 16 years old. While she's studying, she can put a load in and a load out because you're doing all of this and running a business. So very, very Yes, yes. And it, I have a lot of compassion for t- today's kids and today's parents because it's, it's very rough. With my nephew, he lived with us. And we, we actually moved in and uh, we took care of the grandparents and him and things like this. And guess what happened? Um, 
Sebastian was raised very different. And I had to learn that balance because I wanted to be a little bit like my dad with some strict rules. But at the same time, I had to take my cues from my wife who was telling me, look, you have to be a little more gentler. Uh, You can't be so rough. You have to be this. So I had to have that balance. And sometimes with Sebastian, I had to tell him, you know, try doing it this way. You know, so I became more of his his buddy and his uncle and his confidant. And so I had to learn that balance. And at one point, I remember the worst I ever did to it was I leaned into his bedroom one day and I go, hey, you know, your room's a mess, don't you? And he goes, yeah. And he got mad at me. He looked at me like this. I go, your mother's coming back home Saturday after a long trip. I think it would really be nice if the room might be clean. What do You're you kidding. You and asked, like, what do you think? Okay. That's the problem right there, people. I, okay, here's the contrast. Okay. That is classic millenn- boomer parenting of millennial, what you just said. What do you think? How do you feel about doing this? And and the difference would be, I don't feel like cleaning my room, mom. I don't care. I don't feel like doing your laundry. You know, I don't feel like cooking your dinner. I don't feel like driving you to carpool. And so there is this level of what were the expectations that we set? And they were so low because, you know, you just said it. Want to be their friend. Want to be their confidant. What? What? Well, my father, this is how my father would have handled that conversation. He would have, first of all, he would have knocked and opened the door right away. It's my he door. He waited. He, he, said, he, would have looked, he would have looked at me. He goes, you know something? You need to clean your goddamn room. And then he'd shut the door and leave. He goes, and then he'd open it back up. And he goes, you better clean it because you know how your mother does. All right. So let me give you a third option. You've got, you know, the millennial Brad. You've got the dad, Brad's dad version. I think that. And I'm not saying we did everything right, but I did learn this from my mother. And I would look at my kids and I would say, look, there's so many other things to have to battle you on. I'm not going to battle you on your room. You close the door. You know, I'm not going to convince you that making your bed matters. But I will tell you this once a week on Friday before you you know, do your Saturday fun. And as they got older, it was easy to kind of take away the date night or the phone. You know, you got to empty the trash, change your sheets, you know, you know at least clean up your room so there's walkways. And it was that idea of I'm going to choose my battles right. because I was raised and, and also being in the profession, I was able to see how easy it would be to slip into that. And so, you know, my kids thought I was mean. Their dad was the nice one. <laughs> okay. I could see so that. So we've talked about the <laughs> overview of, of rules versus results. Number five, you're going to go on. Then we're going to open up the lines in just a, maybe two to four minutes. Go ahead. Well, number five, and this one is affecting us in the business world because that's where I specialize, and this is this. Uh, Millennials have a tough time firing someone and making an authoritarian-style decision. When you look at Donald Trump, do you see how he acts? Millennials see that as arrogant. They see that as he's a boob, he's an idiot, not a smart, sharp businessman. They see him as a fool. Okay, so, (laughs) you know, I have to train millennials because millennials do have it in them to be very tactical when it comes to business. The millennials I coach with their businesses, I say, you know, I think you need to fire that person. And they're very comfortable with it once they learn it because they've been indoctrinated a little bit in collaboration and collaboration is group thinking. And that doesn't mean it's, that doesn't mean it's a mutual admiration society making all the decisions at once. It just means that everybody's input was considered valuable In the school system. Exactly. So that's number five, which is this sort of group thing collaboration. And they have to get broken out of that a little bit because you are an individual and no one's going to be there to help right. you at the end of the day. That's the true. Uh, it's interesting because I, re- I remember I'm a very competitive so, yeah. person and I only play games with people who really like me because I'm not my best self. Yeah, it's terrible. You. And I'm like, we won, you lost. Ah. <laughs> And so I had this really good friend, and so my kids were growing up, and she was very, you know, we usually have people very different from us. She was very calm, very, you know, I'm very inclusive, but when it comes to games, I'm very competitive. And I'll never forget the day she brought over this non-competitive game for our kids, and I was like, how do you win? She was like, everybody wins when you make the road and the village together. I'm like, well, that's dumb. And so, but she at one level was right. There's a, there's, a, there's a place for collaboration that's so important. And so our kids were taught that group think, that collaboration, that everybody matters. And here's a great thing about that, Brad, that I think is such a valuable part of the millennial generation that br- they bring to us. In our mindset, it was, if I help you get ahead, I lose. Versus, 
a rising tide raises all ships. If I help you get ahead, you're going to help me get ahead. We're going to both yeah. get ahead because we're going to be working together. It's a much more global, I care about you. And I think, I mean, I really admire it when I see it in my, in my kids. So. Yes. Well, uh, I take the martial arts, as you know, and uh, a lot of the young people, I've watched them go from kids uh, into adulthood. And the kids who are in the martial arts, they have learned you have to earn every belt. You have to earn every level. But at the same time, our, our instructors have had to include some of this in their curriculum. There are winners and there are losers. But your job in the martial arts school is you watch your training partner you don't injure your training partner you make sure that you do the moves precisely and and do them the best you can and you try not to hurt them and that's the key and and some of this thinking is a good thing because you always get one person in the martial arts that thinks uh, they're, they're cobra kai and you have to sweep the leg you know and uh, so right you know, before we open the lines that, so so right? some of this thinking is no go ahead okay. say that again i'm sorry but, no what were you yeah, i missed that last part yeah but go ahead some of this thinking some of this thinking is okay but here here's where i really crack up there's a lot of adult teachers who are maybe a little bit younger than us like in their 30s mid 30s and they're teaching our kids and they're the coaches on the baseball team and they have to according to the rules otherwise they get fired tell all the kids hey we did this all together isn't this great and then they turn around and they look at me and go this is bullshit right. you know and they know it right. we all know it we all are sitting here going yay um when are they when are they going to learn what's right and wrong and that there's winners and losers i'm going to be honest with you right now generation y right now is actually quite frustrated especially in the older end because they realize it was all bs it was all crack because in life there are winners and there are losers i hate to say it let's not call them losers let's call them uh well, let me ask you this, Brad. Yeah, let me ask you this, and then we're going to open up the themselves. lines. I have two thoughts that I want to ask you. Um, one is, is there a third option? Because, you know, the Gen Y, there is this idea, like you said, there's there's no. winners and losers. And yet, you know, there <laughs> there has to be a way that we can do all this together. And I think I'm wondering if because of the millennials, like you said, they don't make decisions because if I make this decision, it's going to hurt somebody else or I won't fire that person. So that's an issue. All right, that makes sense right. to me. The right. last thing I want you to address before we open up the, the seats is millennials, you have written here, millennials were taught to follow their passion. And I think that has a lot to do with what we've called and created the boomerang generation. So address that for a few minutes and then we're gonna open up the lines. Sure. Uh, when I was a little kid, my father came up to me and he leaned right into my face and he goes, you know what, son? When you get older, two thirds of your waking life are going to be working. Okay, so two thirds of your awake life, you will be working. So you better figure out something you like to do, buddy. You know, and I'm like 10. <laughs> so I didn't know that most people's parents did not have this conversation with boomers. So mm -hmm. I figured I like business. So I became an entrepreneur and I went into the That's graphic so design funny. area, the advertising. That's so funny because my dad said market. to me, yeah, so, you can, what, he didn't say what do you want to be. I mean, he knew I wanted to be a teacher and he said, you can be a doctor or you can be a lawyer because that's where you're going to get respect and, 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 and salary. You're going to make some money and that's what's important. And I remember telling him, I want to be a teacher. I don't want to be a doctor or lawyer. He goes, well, then you can go into business. But other than that, those are your options. So our kids were like, what do you want to do? What do you feel like? What do you, you know, what's your passion? And our daughter actually went through a number of permutations of her degree seeking because she was, she woke up one day and realized, oh, I'm going to have to do this forever. You know, I don't, I don't know if I want to do politics forever. Right. I'm going to go into graphic arts is actually what she did. And then she ended up teaching. And I'll never forget when our son came home and he said, okay, I just realized that when I finish college, I'm like, I have to be like a grown up. Like, like people are starting to call me a man. Can I be man-ish? Because I don't want to have to be all that responsibility because I'm not sure what my passion is yet. Or I have all these passions. How do I pick one? So for the millennials on the line, if you want to weigh in on that, you know, click in. Right. I'm going to open this seat up and let's start chatting with y'all. Is that okay, Brad? Props, props. Yes, give us some props. Perfect, man. Don't forget. Give us, I'll give give us you some. Props, props. 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 Okay, so I think we had somebody who wanted to join in here. I would love, Dan, Dan, if you're still on, would you pop in here? I would love for you to pop in here. You have to ask to be in. 
to take that open seat. He, Dan's actually, we've been chatting on the side. He is in college um, at JMU, which is my kid's alma mater. So Dan, are you, are you willing to pop in here at least um, audio only? I don't see him in there. Yeah, there you go. I do. I, I want to hear he's, from him. He's an uh, aspiring data scientist striving to make, I lost it, make a food truck s growth hacking consulting well, company. So if you're here still, Dan, pop in here. But any other millennials on our line? Go ahead. Well, well I, I'm going to jump in here real quick. There were certain jobs. I remember when I took my nephew up to um, college and we were going around the dorms and it was his uh, uh, second year. So he's coming back. And some of the young people who were there, uh, they had what I call TV jobs. Uh, they wanted to become a crime scene investigator and they wanted to be a dancer or whatever. And I thought this is interesting how this has influenced the next generation. So, hey, welcome. Hey, Brad. Hey, Susie. How you guys doing? Good, good. I said, hi, hey, Dan, are you at JMU right now? Yes, actually. Pretty cool, yeah. pretty cool. cool. So he's been real participative. I'd love to hear your thoughts on this because you're kind of right in the, in the genre we're talking about. Oh, thank you. Um, can you um, actually, can you just like repeat um, like what the, the main idea was? Topic of discussion, yes. Well, well boomers we were raised with a lot of rules and your generation we removed a lot of those rules and now there's no right or wrong uh you haven't been shamed uh you've been collaborative in your school system and with your your parents and you're probably friends with your parents uh, am i right or they, they're at least your mentors and things like that so we're asking about a new direction uh is there a third way uh, possibly of raising kids. And I think Susie can add to this a little bit more because she's the resident psychologist here. Uh, but yeah, I was asking, was we question? were talking is about it, at that level, I mean, you can weigh in on anything you've heard, but the final question had a lot to do with in the pursue your passion, in the open messages, in the what does Dan want to do, has that created a little bit of confusion and a little bit of, well, I've got six passions. How do I figure this out? Oh, without a doubt, yeah. And I've seen it in college a lot. Um, and I'm with two of my friends, so maybe they might chime in. Oh, please do. Please maybe. do. Yeah. Um, I've noticed in yeah. college a lot that fine. there's a lot of people that don't know what they want to do, and they just go through college aimlessly. And when they get out of college, like they have nothing to show for it. They have no degree. And, uh, I mean, that's I, I think that's one of the main purposes of why so many people like, are, um, like, don't get an occupation. <clears throat> It's okay. <laughs> Would your friends agree with you? Um, um, yeah, Luke, Matt, you guys want to come yeah. in? Here? Hey, Luke, pop in here. This is awesome. So I'm a here at JMU, and I'm a hey, third major as of now. So when people ask me, it's a little broad. It's like, what do you want to do? And then you look at all the major options, and people are like, follow what you want to do. Well, I'm a little yes. lazy. I, I may not pick the best career <laughs> option as of now. Right. Do you feel pressure to decide? I know my kids felt a lot of pressure. Our youngest is tw just turned 25, so he's been out of college two, three years. He felt an incredible pressure to decide and undeclared didn't work, so he picked one and then he wasn't sure he was going to use it. So do you feel pressure from not maybe your peers so much as um, adults in your world? Not that you're not an adult, but you know, the older adults. Well, I just met with my academic advisor so mm -hmm. scheduled for next year, and that was one of her first questions was, have you decided on a major? Right. I have not decided on a major. I've been in college three months now. So I really don't know what I want to do. And I think a lot of it's because ever, especially starting in middle school and high school, they put you in specialty programs. Okay. So, like my little brother's going uh, into, even into middle school, they have like those advanced programs. And then going into high school, you can be in that least by county. You can go into the math, mathematics and science center, the leadership programs, uh, engineering program. Right. Well, do you expect an eighth grader to make a decision on that? wonder if in four years when they're a senior in high school, they're like, engineering is not my thing. Right. You know, that's interesting that you say that, Luke. My son um, really struggled with this in the sports arena. He, you know, when we were growing up, you played lots of sports. You tried lots of things. You played in the, in the street. We didn't have organized sports that you paid for. Um, and then you kind of got to high school and you figured out what you tried out for. Whereas for him, he started very young. We did travel sports because, you know, everybody's kid's going to be the next star athlete. 
And as he got into school, it was like, well, you got to pick yeah. one. You can't play soccer and football and baseball. You've got to be all in in this one thing. And it was really difficult. Like you said, you got to be all in with math or all in with art. And it kind of cuts down the, the options at one level. Which, was, is that kind of what happened? Yeah, I, I think that's completely what happens because they expect you to like really set set a path for your future. Mm -hmm. And so that's what we're yeah. used to doing ever since like, almost a young age from at least what I've seen is it's like pick something that you want to do and go all in for it. And that can be So when we enter in college, right. a lot of people you see, it's like we pick something and then it turns out in two years, oh, that's not what we want to do. Let's change it. Right. Is that is that for the, true for you too, right. Dan? Well, Sorry, Brad. Go ahead. Um. Yeah. Actually, Luke hits the nail on the head oh. there. Let Dan finish. What'd you say, Brad? Uh, part of the reason that you're going through this is that boomers were expected to know what they wanted to do by age. Okay. So by the time we were 20, we were expected to go into a company and shut up listen to our boss, figure it out. you got to know what you're going to do because you're going to stay there for 25 years, right? So by the time you're 30, somebody might see you as management material. And by the time you're 40, uh, you, you're going to start managing a, a division or something. But nowadays, uh, there's so much pressure to compete for jobs. Even in the school curriculum, nobody talked about uh, what you're going to do for a living until I got into high school, late into high school. But now they're starting at eight and nine years old because we're competing for jobs overseas and all this other stuff. And the reality is, is um, uh, they've kind of put so much pressure on you guys. And I'm glad that you're you're kind of uh, pushing back by saying, hey, 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 buddy. I'm going to be undeclared for a little while. Just relax. How do your parents handle that? Awesome. Because I know, um, and thanks for all the props, guys. That's great. We appreciate those. Um, how do your parents handle undeclared? I know I've had both parents say, friends say, oh, my kid's undeclared. What do I tell people? Or, no, I love that my kid's undeclared. Do your parents come down on either side? Um, right now for my dad, it's fine that I'm undeclared. But at the same time, it's like, okay, what do you want to do? Um, both my parents have business, um, bachelors in business. Mm -hmm. From my dad's perspective, working in marketing, he doesn't necessarily want me to go into just that that very broad degree. And mm -hmm. that's what I see. Well, Luke and Dan, uh, when we were growing up, there was no such thing as a multimillionaire <laughs> skateboarder. <laughs> Okay, just just want to let you know that, and that's what your dad's concerned about because he doesn't even know who Tony Hawk is. I, I think that a lot of it comes to we're so far into like the college generations now throughout that there's so many different specialized fields, and no matter what field you pick, there's competition. Right. But what happens if that field you go into, you're not as successful as you want it to be? Yeah, but then you yeah. this college degree for I don't know biochemistry, and then you don't become successful. Well, right. you apply that biochemistry field to somewhere else. Yeah, oh, my my father was really concerned that I wanted to be a graphic designer because I had art skills. He was petrified that I was going to be a starving artist and I was going to be broke and I was going to be all these things and living in a van down by the river. Uh, and so I spent a lot of time proving him wrong. So, uh, Susie, uh, are you? I just did without muting. Sorry, I again? stopped. <laughs> um, I was trying to say hi to Trish. We have nobody else who joined us. Trish joined us, and we've got some others who joined us. We do have one open seat, so feel free to, to pop in here. Here's what I want to know from Dan and Luke, and that is with the sense of undeclared, with the sense of possibility, you know, we have all these options. Does that feel more like more freedom and more exciting or is there more pressure to figure it out um well we i before we tuned in i was talking about chipotle and why they're successful and how they narrow it down they don't give like right. the customers the option to be like do you want option one or 136 right you know, burrito burrito bowl or salad okay very simple great point but right it's really hard to sit here at undeclared and look at a list of 60 undergraduate degrees and then a whole another list of combinations for primaries and then 
your your parents don't even know there's that many combinations. Yeah. That's the problem. So is that is that do you feel pressure or confused or like phew, I don't gotta deal with that? Right now I, I feel like I don't have to deal with it. Okay. I know it I have only finish this semester, next semester, and then I have to declare something. Now I can okay. right. that throughout my college career it may prolong it, but the pressure is coming down. And I and so Got it. Half, half of the people are like, no, it's good. Go undeclared. And then the other half are like, do something. Okay. Yeah. Change it. Yeah. How but, about you, Dan? Um, well, so Luke's a freshman. I'm a junior. I mean, I'm sorry. Luke's a junior. I'm a freshman. I mean, hang on. No, no, no. Freshman, Luke, junior. Yeah, I got it. Three months freshman. You're the junior. Got it. <laughs> yeah. it's, it's, it was a long night. Um, so, um, and when I was a freshman, I was also undeclared. And um, like, I didn't see any pressure um, going into my freshman year. Like, no one was like bashing me, like, oh, you're undeclared. I knew I wanted to do something in business. Um, so I just stuck with like taking the uh, principal business classes. And uh, then eventually I joined right. economics. And I think I was a little, I pressured myself into going to the economics degree. Um, but I don't know, I think overall, yeah, I appreciate economics and it was good, but I, I, I definitely felt pressured, especially at the end of my freshman year to get a, um, get to have some, to have some major, to have some degree of. Kind of this myth of get it together. Right. <laughs> yeah. Oh, right. And, and then you find out that no college student has anything together, and then you're like, well, okay. No, no nobody did. Nobody did. Yeah. We, we it's, pretended it's, we did. But, uh, uh, re Reality LN said um, that uh, things are happening and shifting so quickly that uh, the college degree really doesn't help. And this is the other thing I point out, and that is this, uh, the college degree, actually, they're still trying to get you to get degrees in, in uh, mm -hmm. areas that don't exist anymore. Uh, you know, like, like and, and then they're also trying to get you to get college degrees in things you never got a college degree in, like entrepreneurialism. Well, and you can't get a degree before. in that. You have you to get a to degree school. in it by doing it, not by sitting in a room. And I think college is going to change. Great point, Real exactly. TLN. Okay, another question for everybody, and that is this. Brad opened us up by talking about rules versus results, meaning we were very rules. If you checked off the rules, you got an A versus we feel like millennials are much more, the results are what matter. Like if you can get the results in 10 minutes, then 10 minutes is plenty versus you better work on it for an hour. Would you agree with that? Or how would you come in on that, those two questions? I'm curious for the millennials who are with us. Uh, go, can you repeat that real quick? Oh, I'm reading. Sorry, some of what somebody went to school saying. for entrepreneurship. My question to the, to the millennials on the. Uh, and you, sh by the way, let me let me finish this. You shouldn't need to go to school for entrepreneurship because entrepreneurship has nothing to do with college. It has to do with starting a business. Uh, and that was something, and I'm not judging it, that was something we never went right. to college for. That was like, are you kidding me? You went to college to become academic, to learn more, to be able to think bigger and better. And you had the business path, which was start a business. So those things have- It's interesting. My husband- started his first business at 19. He came from an entrepreneurial family. His brother had started a business. They all were in business. And so when we got married, he was 21. He'd already been in business for two years. I was in college. And I think my dad was pretty okay with us marrying him because he was already pretty successful at 19. Um, and so it's what's funny is now he's in the boomer generation and there's been jobs he's looked at and they're like, well, you don't have a degree. And I'm like, oh my gosh, he could run circles around what you're doing because he's run all these businesses. And so... That was my problem for many years. But okay. What was the question? I want to go back to this. <laughs> I do think college might change as we know it because it does feel a little bit, and it'd be interesting to have you guys weigh in on this before I go back to my other question. Do you think being in college, now I love JMU, all my kids went there. Do you think that college as it stands is becoming irrelevant, is becoming redundant? And would you, if you could restructure it in a way that felt more fluid? Dan, uh, I want you to answer that. Oh, Arlo, yes. go ahead. I, for me, I see it as like an undergraduate degree almost holds no value now. Unless you hold that doctorate, PhD, master's level, you're just one of millions. 
So to set you like what all that's going right. on now is how do you set yourself apart? It's no longer about that work experience or what you can do in the actual job position. They will they will weed you out of the job pool if you don't have masters. Because they look at you as oh you're not as an educated, but a formal education only goes so far. Right. You have a doctorate degree in whatever major, but the person with an undergraduate degree may be able to communicate and develop a business plan better than you can because they have more experience doing so. There's only so far the classroom setting can take. That's so true. In fact, I have two master's degrees, and, and my business coach, who is in the online world, said, take those off. Like, nobody cares anymore. And I had to pause and go, those were a big deal. I'm still thinking about going to get my doctorate. What are you talking about? And so it's exactly what you said. It's irrelevant. Okay, Dan, you answer. And um, you know what I mean? It's a car ride for me to go help them out. But if I'm in San Diego and Jonathan says, Tim, I want to be having a thing in the coast of Maine. Uh, oh, it's my fault. Um, okay. Um, <laughs> I thought that was me. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I agree with Luke on most of the things that he said. Um, but I still think college is important to go to without a doubt. I, I, I know people are people, there's people on Blab that are calling me, like, you know, why are you in college? You shouldn't be in college. And, um, like, they say it's a waste right. of time. But I, I honestly think college um, teaches you and it shows that you can learn and that you can, not necessarily think outside the box, but, you know, definitely like apply things that you learn like freshman year because you need uh, to grab it. Yeah, I I look at it this way. Um, we went insane back in the '80s because uh, I remember this. I went to an art school and it was a tech school because I wanted to get out and I wanted to work. And all of a sudden, they wanted you to get experience. When I was growing up, you had to have experience, and you would start at the bottom and work your way up. And suddenly now, nobody wanted the experience. They wanted the college degree, and then they wanted a master's degree, and then all of a sudden. The real people with real experience were being pushed aside for people coming right out of college with a master's degree. And somehow we saw them as the, the gods that need to be hired right away. And this changed business. And business is now starting to realize that was a huge mistake because you do need experienced people to train those people coming right out of college because they have theory and the people who have experience have experience. But here's the big shift. The people who have all this experience don't realize how much everything has changed. So they're talking that boomer nonsense again where, you know, you have to earn your way, kid, and you need to obey the rules. We have to let go of that because we're moving too fast. So academically, the colleges and the schools have not changed at all. They're still teaching the same way we did. In the I don't know that I'd agree with that. So I, I don't know that I'd agree with that, Brad. Board. Well, we, we, we've added the technology but look at the Khan Academy that's how you teach people you it, it has to be more I would agree I would agree Adam style. Tech 71 said education is still very important to always learn and grow no matter your age Absolutely. I agree with that but what does that do how we get educated and learn will change depending on the available tools I would agree with that I would agree with that so there you go Okay. That's exactly um, I want to know I've got this whole chat room over here of people who know each other Adam knows Morgan Morgan knows uh, you know, it's, you know, all these people. So how do y'all know each other? Are y'all JMU? Are you just in the tech world? No. All right, I'm having a... Yeah, I mean, I, I just know I just know Adam from Blab. I'm, I'm pretty sure most of us have met on Blab and we've talked to each other and we've, you know, had this space interaction and we cool. felt like that we've become friends just by... You know, yeah, I that's, that's really cool. Let me ask you this. As boomers, okay, so here's the deal. Blab, I, when Blab came out, I was like, what? You know, so talk to me just, this is totally off topic. I'd love to know your thoughts on Periscope and Blab. Um, yeah, I mean, Paris, I've, I've used Periscope. Um, honestly, I don't think Periscope's that big. Uh, I mean, even for, like, what do you do for each other? I mean, yeah, see, Luke doesn't even know what Periscope is. So, <laughs> well, well it, it was Miracat, it was Miracat. And then Periscope, and those two got together, and everybody's like, "Oh, we can do a show." I even did a show while I was heading on Meerkat, a TV right. show. I was doing this thing, right? And then Blab came along, and everybody said, 
those guys are idiots. And now we're tall and black because you can have four people on, which is great. I'm uh, trying to let him in. I've tried to let him in a couple webinar. of times. He hasn't been able to get in. So here's another question for you guys. Yeah. If you don't mind, um, tell us some things like we're we're coming at this from I'm a boomer parent. We're cuspers, really. And I have three kids who are millennials, and so we're working from what we know. And it's, I've asked my son and my girls a lot about this, and I'm hoping he'll join us from Israel one day This in one of these labs. What are some things that you have seen from your parents that if you had them in a room and you could stand up and go, okay, we want you all to understand this about us. What, what are two or three things that you'd be like, if we could just get them to understand this, what would that be? That's a really good question. No one's ever asked that before. <laughs> I ask those questions for a living as a, as a coach, so that makes sense. Um, so think on those. You can, you can think on those if you want and put, bring them up for the next lab. Maybe this is an easier one for you. Okay. What is it that you don't get about your, your boomer parents? Like, can you, Susie and Brad, since you're like them, explain this? Or is that another one you got to think on? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Old people. <laughs> And if you have a thought, you can certainly pop it in the chat box. Okay. Um, and we would agree with you, Adam, about the tech college. Education is great. I'm a, still a self-educator. Go ahead, Dan. I don't know. It just seems like um, they have all these basic questions about technology, and I'm like, it's, it's common sense. It's, uh, I, I, I don't think they're willing to uh, – I don't think they're willing to find out themselves. I just, like, they always just ask me to do it, and I'm like, it's – you know. It's, if you just think logically about it, you just look at what the words are saying, then you understand it. No, no, I just don't, I just don't think we try at all. Yeah, I got into, I've gotten to the point with like when my parents ask me to do stuff, it's like you do this. <laughs> yeah. Millennials, millennials are not patient. Well, and, and, you know, and, oh, let me send you a YouTube on it, Mom and Dad, because I don't want to sit here next to you. That's awesome. That's awesome. That is funny. That is funny. Well, uh, I can tell you this, you know, I, I was part of the dot com boom, the first one, and I had to learn the technology and how it works. And I know just enough to be dangerous. OK. And even I am sitting here going, wait a minute, how does this work? Like today I'm on my iPhone. I said, screw my computer on Blab because it, it was causing so much problem. I just went on my iPhone and it's built to do this. So, you know, those little things like that. But I can tell you guys this. Your parents, our brains were constructed differently through habits and the way we were raised growing up. And one of those things is we're taught everything's linear and you hoard knowledge. So we hold on to knowledge. It's very hard for us to break that habit and now just get rid of what we just learned and learn something new and get rid of what we learned and learn something new. Your brains have been trained through video games and technology and CompuServe CD discs, upgrades and upgrades. You guys you don't retain anything. You just keep moving and moving and moving. That's impossible for a boomer to do unless we retrain ourselves. Physically, your brains are different than ours. And they've proven that. Well, I know for like my dad, when I do, if he does want to know how to do something, he likes to like write it down, physically write it down, pen and paper, and you go do it. Where, What's wrong with that? Where, where, where <laughs> we do it, where he's like, do you know how to do this process? Yeah. Right. I, write, I write everything down um, where like as millennials we we may know how to do it but each time we do it it's more or less a process of figuring it out we don't remember how to do it. we don't right. have this set path it's like how do i figure this out again we're kind of always reinventing right. the way we do something yeah and, and is that, fr that frustrating for your parents or your your instructors um sometimes yeah for our instructors without for our professors without a doubt most of them are when uh, we pull out our phones for a few seconds yeah. okay I've, I've got a chat here somebody go. said this and i want to get anybody who's a millennial to go ahead and, and comment on this morgan ingram said because um it says most people are stubborn and not willing to learn and grow with the adaptations and some millennials won't venture further because they have too high of egos to flourish would you agree or disagree with that um, well, the third friend that's in the room, he just nodded his head. Uh, okay, tell him why. Tell us why. Uh, no, he's, he's camera shy. Okay, that's fine. He can talk. Be auto only. Just have him by the by the mic and just tell us why he why he nodded because that's pretty huge. 
And actually, Morgan, who said it, just typed in, I'm a millennial, by the way. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Well, I mean, I wouldn't say it's their ego, but like they've done this, this the same way over a long period of time. Like it's difficult for them to change. That's the other thing I'm doing now. We couldn't hear him. What did he say, Dan? Um, he said that uh, they were it's not necessarily stubborn, but they just been they were just going up and taught by just by like using their, their phones and stuff that they're just not like not doing yeah. things. You know. They're, they're, they're just focused on, you know, like using their phones. I, I think that Matt brings up a good point. Yeah, like we're always, we're always we use this for everything. You know, this is, I mean, this is the world at our fingertips. And I think, and with with information this powerful, I don't even need to remember as much. And as bad as our brains are different. Yeah. Right. Our, 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 I mean, I'm, I'm why not, should I learn something that I can find on my phone? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, I'm not a big science guy. At all, but right. Like the memory part of your brain or whatnot. Could be like well, without a doubt, like less existent than yours because, like you know, we don't have that that thrive that thrive to retain. Actually, it. it's better. Let Brad address us. He's really done some science. Uh, those of you who are listening who are boomers, you may notice that when you go to a restaurant, you ask the waiter for the drink order. They come back two minutes later and they can't remember. With who gets what drink, or even if they they have the drink, and part of the reason is we've now allowed the GPSs and everything else to store our information, so we don't use our brains and our short term memory the same way, and uh, it shows up now with millennials. Susie, can you still remember your home phone number growing up as a kid? Three zero one nine four six yeah, because nine two four six. Met- yeah. Yeah, two seven three six zero eight six. Yeah, I remember it perfectly. But this next generation, they've taken some of that short-term memory and the data that you had to memorize, and it's on their phones. So they're not even utilizing that. And it actually frees them up to learn the next software and the next group and the next thing. But it, like I said, it has changed your brains uh, at such a level that – um, you're moving quicker. And I just want to say one thing about this, uh, the ego part of it. We all have egos. And what they've learned is that these corporations, um, some of the boomers, uh, they've created fiefdoms within the organization and they've hoarded the knowledge and they have their own office and they're sitting there going, <laughs> look at me, I'm the, you know, the big powerful emperor of whatever scary. is going on in that brain. And uh, right. And the reality is it also happens with millennials because millennials, you're kind of mini boomers. And the reason boomers are upset is that you usually had to wait till you were 50 to get that arrogant. Okay. <laughs> because you achieved something and you could hold on to it. And here was the proof. I have a Mercedes. You don't. Um, so you, you definitely have egos, but it's, it's in a different way. It's about the technology. You just cannot understand why we can't keep up. And I'm a rare uh, boomer. I can keep up to a point, but um, you control your own fiefdoms through the technology. And the funny part is, is boomers invented this technology. You guys are the byproduct of using it. Uh, And and it is your skill set. But wait for the next generation. They're going to be pushing up against you by the time you hit your 40s. And it's happening already. Is there like a happy balance for how much technology how much we do it. Because even like my younger cousin who's five has had an iPad for two years. So that's, my niece has as well. Even Dan and I, when we were younger, we didn't have that technology. So we even really introduced more of them until we were like 10. Like, right. Really starts to, but now we have a whole younger section coming in that's been integrated since almost when they were one. This is like- right, and Brad's going to address that. And we're going to have a yeah. boomer, uh, one of these blabs about the cloud kids, and that's really what they are, different from you. And, and we'll get to that on another one, yeah. a couple, I think it's three or four down the road. But here's the thing I think is so interesting with your question, Luke, is is there a happy medium? Because I know for me, especially because I work in the world of relationships and I speak and teach all over the world with that, there's this idea of can millennials have relationships because they're always like this? Can they have a conversation? You know, I text more with my daughter than I do with, you know, than I do with on the phone. And, you know, it's interesting to me. Have you heard that? Do you find that your, that your relationships are still deep, even though it's done in a much less face-to-face way? Um, so, sometimes I use my phone a lot to communicate 
which makes me mad, is just to set up meetings to talk to people face to face when other people just want to hold up conversations over like text. Mm -hmm. And okay. then, I don't like to do that. That's not how I was raised. And in some parts, yeah. like, I'm behind, but then I don't feel like it's a bad thing. Right. Well, I would agree at one level because relationships really are the only currency that we have when it all settles, all the dust settles. What about you, Dan? Um, wait, so the question, what was the, what was the question exactly? Do you feel like your relationships are different because of your technology? Um, I guess different as opposed to not having technology at all. But I mean, I, I, honestly, I appreciate it. I, uh, I mean, I, I, I could you know, call my mom, I could text my mom, I could see how she's doing it. Well, you wouldn't call her, right? And, and I love technology. Our son's in Israel, and I love FaceTime because I see him and talk to him more than I do our daughter who's 30 miles away. So I guess the question, though, is has yeah. the texting and quick interaction that a phone, I'm looking down like I'm doing it, that a phone gives you, has it changed your relationships in a way that you don't feel, I mean, my guess is you feel probably closer to your mom because you wouldn't call her and go, how was your day? How you doing? Right? Yeah, um, no, without a doubt, it's definitely changed. I mean, I've, you know, I've been, I think Luke and I, or at least me, I've been using technology for so long that it's, you know, it's just been part of me, and I, I just don't recall, you know, using yeah. it without it. Um, he, even when we didn't have right. iPhone, we just had the phone and stuff, but I was still texting, and it, it still felt unique and more productive. Jump in here real quick, and I want to uh, do a shout out to Tom Markham. He said he took his father's phone number when his father died, and he actually uh, made it his Google uh, number and his cell phone number. And I think that's incredibly touching. Uh, yeah, that's fantastic. Yeah, I love that. and Adam said I do love that, Tom. And a lot of people have talked about their the the benefits of technology, and that you know, like the relationships people are building here. Like I would never be able to talk to you guys without this. So this is pretty cool. We're coming up on 11:30, and it's fabulous to have all you on the on the show and or on the blab and talk to us. And we have a bunch more of these coming up, so I'm really excited. Brad, do you want to kind of wind us down and bring us home and close us out? Yeah. Yes. Um, I want you to understand that baby boomers see authority as a position, something you earn to get to that level. And if they have the word DR in front of their name and all these things, that is considered valid. That's why you listen to them. But with millennials, it's about creating a relationship with no like and trust model. And being on a blab like this, you guys get a chance to meet me and Susie. And that's how you operate. You want to be face to face, even if it's using the technology. And that's how you respect people. And that's how you start working with them uh i just want to uh, put this out there real quick but the other thing that boomers like is face to face and i agree with you luke i think that's a great thing i remember one day i said to my wife um you know i gotta i gotta tell this person off i gotta talk to them and my wife goes why do you have why can't you just do it in a phone call i said because you don't do this kind of thing on a phone you do it face to face and i still think that that is a very valuable way to do that um and, and I, it really is moving away from this, um, you know, boomers were all about the individuality. I'm an individual and I'm going to kick butt and I'm going to do all these things. And I think your generation is really going to bring us back to something that's more humanistic on this planet because most of our businesses, our government and everything, this is based on military hierarchy. Sorry, I had a phone call come in. It's really based on military hierarchy, and we are getting away from that. We're creating a new world, as all Alvin Toffler called it. The third wave is coming, and the third wave is a gentler, kinder way of doing business and living life and living on Earth and things like that. Yeah. And I just want to shout out, thank you, everybody, for joining us today. We had a really great uh, blab, and we had a lot of people on. A lot of fun. Relief. A lot of fun. A lot of yeah. fun. And thank you to y'all who, again, for just being on camera, sharing your thoughts with us. It's so fun to see. And if you are audio or camera shy, you can join one of our flabs just via audio. We could just make sure that happens. And so I hope you're on our next one. It's going to be Tuesday, I believe, right? Uh, yes, we're probably going to be back on Tuesday. And what's our next topic? Oh, mixed messages. We sent a lot of mixed messages to your generation, and we apologize. And we're going to talk about <laughs> movies and all that kind of stuff. So that's going to be real fun. Have we a great day. It. Have a great weekend. Thanks, you guys. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Thank you, Luke. And thank Thanks, you, guys. mystery guest. Mystery guest, <laughs> Bye -bye. yes. Thank you. Bye.